we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made for them a statue and an ordinance in Shechem. And we pick up here this story where Joshua has gathered the people to remind them who their God is and what he's about. They were constantly distracted. The people of God, they, they struggled. They struggled with those nations around them, with their other gods, their idols. And it really caused problems for them. It, it was a distraction. It pushed upon them and enticed on them their other gods, which brought about other attitudes, other behaviors, things that were ungodly. They needed to stay with their true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Just like God's people then needed reminders, we have to have reminders ourselves too. And we look at this history to bring in remembrance what was done here. And I think it's good to see that Joshua was really driving home the why. Why do we stay with this true God and how important that is? But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The decision was presented Make up your mind. And it, it really, as a, a point of interest and a, and a key piece to our understanding of God and what we have to choose, we have to have this question and be able to answer this, I think, on a daily basis. We're going to jump down and talk a little bit about Ruth here. But Ruth said in verse uh, six, uh, chapter 16, verse 1, Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go, and wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. What do you think Ruth was thinking about when she was making these statements? Do you think that she was making plans based on the choice that she was presented? Now, if you don't know the story of Ruth and Naomi and, and the interactions there, you should probably read that. It's an excellent account of someone that had to make some choices in their life. Life uh, had kind of made some hard turns for Ruth. And she had to review and look at what she was presented, grasp the understanding of who Naomi's God was, the people of God that she was among, and then make a decision. And she states here very clearly, Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. And the most important piece, and your God will be my God. And since the world is constantly presenting itself as other ideas, other concepts, other religions and gods, these are the choices that were presented. And we have to sort this out, just like Ruth did. 1 Kings 18 17 through 40. 1 Kings 18, verse 17. Then it happened when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said to him, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have. And that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed the Baals. Now, therefore, send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel, the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab, Ahab sent for all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel. And Elijah came to all the people and said, how long will you falter between two opinions if the lord is god follow him but if baal follow him but the people answered him not a word then elijah said to the people i alone am left a prophet of the lord but baal's prophets are 450 men therefore let them give us two bowls and let them choose one bowl for themselves cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood but put no fire under it, and I will prepare the other bowl and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. Then you call on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. 
And the God who answers by fire, he is God. So all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. Now Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one bull for yourselves and prepare it first, for you are many, and call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. So they took the bull which was given them, and they prepared it, and called on the name of Baal from morning even till noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, no one answered. Then they leaped about the altar which they had made. And so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is meditating, or he is busy, or he is on a journey, or perhaps he is sleeping and must be awakened. So they cried aloud and cut themselves as was their custom with knives and lances until the blood gushed out of them. And when midday was past, they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, but there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. Then with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar, large enough to hold two seahs of seed. And he put the wood in order, cut the bowl in pieces, and laid it on the wood, and said, Fill four water pots with water, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Then he said, Do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, Do it a third time. And they did it a third time. So the water ran all around the altar, and he also filled the trench with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust, and it licked up the water that was on, in the trench. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal, do not let one of them escape. So they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and executed them there. Kind of a long reading, but I wanted us to kind of get the full sense of what is being displayed here. And clearly we see God's power demonstrated at the end. Clearly we see that the Baals, the God that they followed, those prophets did not speak, did not deliver. It didn't matter how much they leapt and cut themselves and did all the things that they thought would get his attention. It didn't matter. Now, a little history here. Ahab is the king of the northern tribes. This is God's people. He was the ruler at this time uh, when Elijah was the prophet. Elijah, Elijah and Ahab were at odds Ahab was frustrated with the word of God that would be delivered by Elijah. It just never seemed to quite go the way he wanted to hear it. And I think that's another little sub-lesson in all of this. Sometimes we want to hear things the way we want to hear it, and that's not necessarily the truth. Ahab had forsaken Jehovah, his God, and turned to Balaam, turned to the Baals to worship. Elijah was sent by God to demonstrate to the people who they should really be worshiping, and showed through Elijah his power and authority. We see that Elijah gave the credit to who? It went to God. It wasn't something that he said that he was doing. He called on the Lord, and the Lord delivered. It's a powerful reminder for us to consider our choice of God, the right God. We have to worship him so that we can gain his favor. If we don't do that, we could very much end up like these prophets. Just a, a, a nice and a very pointed uh, story to give us some background to 
this question, choose you this day. Now, we're going to make a quick jump into the New Testament here, and hopefully we can uh, make a connection here. <clears throat> John 4, 23 and 24, Jesus has traveled into the land of Samaria, which is, interestingly enough, very close to these uh, northern part of the land. And here we pick up his statement here in cha chapter 4, verse 23 and 24. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Now, if you are attending the history class uh, that Keith is leading, uh, you'll note there's a connection here that Christ makes with the Samaritan woman. And I know I've kind of jumped into the middle of this interaction with her. <laughs> But just a little history to here to help us remember, the people of the northern tribes were given other places to worship by Jeroboam after the ten tribes split away from Judah. He feared if they went back to Jerusalem to worship Jehovah, as was commanded by the people, right? There was one place for them to worship, and that was in Jerusalem at the temple. If they would do that, his subjects would travel away from his land and end up not coming home not coming back to be his subjects. And uh, worse yet, they might even rebel against him. So Jeroboam created an, a false religion. He basically took the concepts of the Mosaic Law and of the, the teachings that they had and basically made it convenient for the people. He set up two idols in two different locations. I think one was in Shechem and the Maybe the other one was a Bethel or Bethel and, Dan. Bethel and Dan. Thank you. Yeah, and this was a lot more convenient because all these people in the northern part of the land, they could, instead of having to make that long trip down, could stay up north. And on top of it all, he created a false priesthood so that they could sacrifice and do the things that they thought would be right in the sight of God. So this was a real problem because it led those people away from the true God. And ultimately, it destroyed them. They got scattered and, and taken all over the world. So how do we connect this with John 4 and this statement with uh, the Samaritan woman? So as, Je as Jesus was traveling through this land of Samaria, he encounters this woman who perceives that he is the prophet of God. And Jesus says, our fathers worshiped in this mountain and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh, when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. He informs her that soon the location of where we worship will no longer matter. And we'll, we'll talk about that more a little later. But it's a really interesting thing. So you see the history that happened way back in the Old Testament with the tribes and how things were split. And then this is an interaction that pops up as Jesus is spread, spreading the gospel, comes across this Samaritan woman who has this kind of false mixed religion thing where she's making statements. She kind of believes in a Messiah, kind of believes in the one true God, but because of the way things were established many, many years ago, really was lost but she perceives that she's talking to the prophet of God, and Jesus takes this opportunity to bring this about, and of course, for our benefit, it's recorded. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The idea that we have one God to worship is, is critical in understanding who he is to our salvation. Deuteronomy 6.4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Simple, direct, helps us really connect that there's no other God. And there's so many other verses that do a great job, and those were brought up this morning, that really help us realize the one God and who he is. Why not join Israel, and then we have the right God? Sounds kind of easy, doesn't it? We're going to pursue that a little bit. And I just think I'd like to state that 
there is a connection with Israel and salvation leading into the time of Christ. We call this that Judeo-Christian connection. It's, it's something that the world actually struggles with. And it brings to mind a conversation that I had with a, a, a woman many years ago through my work. And it turned out that uh, we had a chance to sit down and, and have a lunch. And it came up that uh, this concept, as we were sharing just some of our personal lives and things that we, we do, and I mentioned here my uh, work with the church and the things that I'm involved in. And, and she just right away was like, I've never understood the Judeo-Christian connection. And it was uh, very interesting. I hadn't ever had anybody just say that. And uh, it, it was an excellent opportunity. Couldn't get everything in, you know, you can, uh, that you, you can say about it, but definitely was able to bring up some background there. And interestingly enough, I think it is confounding to the world. This Old Testament, New Testament, and there's, there's almost, they're almost pitted against each other instead of actually uh, connecting them in harmony. We can bring the Old Testament forward just like the apostles did, just like Jesus did, because that is a foundation. These are the things that teach us about God and what his plans are. So I asked the question, why not join Israel and have the right God? Let's read in Matthew 21, 43. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And this was brought up this morning in the adult class. When Christ comes on the scene, the nation of Israel has been swallowed up by the Roman Empire. The temple is still basically there. The priesthood is kind of there. Um, but there's a lot of dysfunction. And the leadership, they've been, well, corrupted. Uh, they've corrupted the sacrifices. They were selling animals right there in the temple. Uh, they had adopted many false beliefs. And through greed, they positioned themselves in league with Rome over the people. And so the state of Israel and the state of their worship of God and their sacrifices and things were very much compromised in the eyes of God. It displeased him. So he sent his son to establish a new nation of people that would produce the fruits he is wanting. And you can see it here. God will be, uh, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. We read uh, in Matthew 16, verse 18, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Jesus speaks and states that his church will be established, and it will prevail against the gates of Hades, or hell, or death. This is a powerful gospel message reminding us of one of the key promises of God's plan a resurrection of righteousness. It's an important text to remember because a lot of times we tend to uh, hear people say, well, how could this faith, this truth be carried along and come through the ages and still be the right truth with the right God? And here we see that Jesus establishes a clarity here. His church will not fail. It will not fail. That's a point of hope for all of us. And I brought up the word resurrection. We have to connect that clearly we fail. We don't live forever. We aren't going to sustain ourselves uh, to be in the kingdom. That is through resurrection. And we'll bring that up more as we go along here. Mark 16, 15 through 16. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but who does not believe will be condemned. These are the steps of salvation. We have to hear it. We've got to believe. And then we make that commitment. Choose you this day. Right? If we don't do this, the alternative is what? 
and we see the word condemnation here. And we'll just cut to the chase. That's death. That's not living. Not a good result. Reading on, John 17, 21. That they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that you sent me. Jesus, in his preaching and teaching of the gospel, trying to bring unity, trying to bring an understanding of who his father was and at, that he came in his word, in his authority. The church is the vehicle, the, the organization, that new nation of God that he, Jesus, set up and established. And here we see John recording what Jesus said here, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be one in us. We see the unity based on the words that God has spoken through his son, through his apostles, through the prophets. All of this is connected together. That the world may believe that you sent me. This is the problem. We saw it in the time of Joshua. We see it in the time of the kings. Distractions, other gods, other teachings, steering us away from the true God. The danger is that it's false, and it cannot lead to salvation, to eternal life. All of us want that goal, that reward. And if we don't stay attuned to the true God, it can escape us. John eleven forty two, and I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Boy, that's kind of an obscure grab out of the middle text, isn't it? Well, we're going to give you a little background here. In John 11 is the story of Jesus' friend, Lazarus. What happened to Lazarus? He died. And he's been told that Lazarus is dead. And of course, it's very uh, sad. Death is never a fun and enjoyable thing. And he didn't want to lose his friends just like we don't want to lose our friends. So with the death of his friend Lazarus, Jesus speaks openly prior to calling him forth from the grave so that those around would know where the power was coming from. Remember, Christ didn't do anything of himself. He called on his father. Sounds like Elijah, right? Calling on his God. He called on the power <clears throat> around, let's see, so that those around would know where the power was coming from and to help them believe the true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who sent him with this authority. The authority is established because of the power. The power that was demonstrated was that Lazarus was called, come forth, and he got up out of that grave and walked out. So the authority and the power was established, and Jesus wanted it to be clear. He said it aloud so that those around would hear and take note of that. In John 6, 38, 38, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. We're seeing a pattern. We're seeing the evidence. Jesus was here based on what his father told him to do on his father's will, not his own. So what does the church have to believe about God? We've established that the nation of Israel lost their preeminence, that the kingdom and the message that was tied to them was taken away, and he was establishing, Jesus was establishing his new people, this church. And we have to understand that the God hasn't changed. This is the same God of the Old Testament and of the New Testament. So what does the church have to believe about God? Starting out on Hebrews eleven six, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. 
this text speaks really well for itself. We have to believe. We talked about that belief. We hear the truth. We believe in it. We get baptized. Choose you this day. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder. What's so important about the reward? Well, we've already spoken about our existence. We don't last forever. We have to have a God that can resurrect us and bring us into this kingdom. We need that so that we can have that better life. But look at the conditional statement here of those who diligently seek him. And this is, again, the warning that was given, Old Testament, and now in the New Testament, if we get lazy, if we slack off and don't keep these words in the front of our minds, we could miss out on that reward. Diligent, that word means work, hard work. That means we have to make an effort. James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. We can trust in our God. He doesn't change. He's always the same. And this carries from day one, Genesis 1-1, 1, 1, all the way through to our very moment today. He doesn't shift. He doesn't variate. Why is that so important? Well, we all can understand that if our God made rule changes without us being aware, of, or maybe we were aware and we just couldn't understand it, it becomes a problem. So knowing that our God is always the same is such a blessing, so important. And of course, who wouldn't deny the gifts that he gives us? The blessing of our life and the things that he helps us with. They come down from the Father of lights. John 17, 3, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. John, the book of John just repeats over and over the same consistent messaging. Who God is, knowing what he's accomplished by his will, and then the role that his son plays and how we participate through his son into those plans. Jesus was sent by his father. We see that, uh, how important this was, because when he came on the scene, the nation of Israel had dropped the ball. They weren't getting the message, the gospel message, the message of salvation, the way that God intended it to be done. He sent his son to clean up that mess, and he started the church which is what we are part of today. 1 Corinthians 8, 4 through 6. Okay. Get my old Bible page turn the skills back here. First Corinthians chapter 8. Verse 4. Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is no other God but one. For even if there are so called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we for him and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through, through whom are all things and through whom we live. We come to these references to help us remember that this is how it was established. This is how the church is set up. God preeminent. He's the one that has put together this plan. His son came and has delivered and executed on that plan, started the church. He is our Lord. He is our Messiah. And we must follow his commands. They're given to him by his father. This is the same God that gave the commands from day one and all the way up through till now. First Timothy 2 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. I don't know how many times I read this text, and it's always 
It helps us remember exactly how God has set things up, the roles that are being played. Now, this word mediator, it's so important. I, I, as I was prepping this lesson, I was thinking of Job. What was Job's challenge? He was put to test, wasn't he? And in uh, Job chapter 9, 32 and 33, he says, For he is not a man, speaking of God, as I am, that I should answer him, and we should come together in judgment. Neither is there any daysman betwixt us that might lay his hand upon us both. We have a mediator. This is Jesus, the Son of God. He is so important to our salvation because as a man, someone that understands what we are going through, he has gone through. He made the right choices. Choose you this day. Jesus did it. And without him, we have no hope. We don't get the grace and the promises that God has promised. We can't get that eternal life. It's so important for us. Job needed that. He pleaded for it. It was so important to him because it was just him and that God, that God that's so tough, so severe, right? What did he tell Joshua to do to those prophets? Take them out and kill them. These are tough things. We need that daysman, that mediator. 1 John 2 Eight, uh, 18 through 22. Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. If, for, for if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest, that none of them were of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist, who denies the Father and the Son. Warnings. Always warnings against false Christ that would come and deceive the people of God. Deception and lies are what drives all the problems that we deal with. Does this seem familiar to the nation of Israel? This is a warning to the church. Identifying who the father of lies is. I reference John 8, 44. It's so critical for us to understand who that is. He's the father of lies, that's Satan. And he has been the one that's driven a lot of the things that we see in this world that have led people away from the true God. And then as far as the nation of Israel went, they, they are, their role, the things that they were set up to do for the world as an example was taken away from them. 1 Timothy 6, 14 through 16, that you keep his commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ's appearing, which he will manifest in his own time, he who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. God is behind all of this, the true God, the only true God. And we have to keep his commandments up until the time of his appearing. Has Christ come back yet? No. So our job, our effort has not and will not be complete until that comes. So the question still stands, what must we do as the church of God? Keep his command commandments and obey. Those commandments don't do us any good if we don't follow them. 1 Corinthians 15, 24 through 29. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. 
for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet, but when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now when all these things are made subject to him, then the son of the son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are, do not rise at all, why then are they baptized for the dead? We see as we read through the whole chapter of 1 Corinthians 15, this is the resurrection chapter. But inside this reading, it's clear and it's given us a picture of the future that God will establish this. He will use his son. He will set up the kingdom through his son. And when things all come to an, a final completion of his plan, Jesus will turn around and hand that kingdom over to his father. This helps us to clearly see the role of Jesus, the son of God, a man born of woman, how he plays and how, or how it plays into uh, God's plan and he always put his father above himself without this understanding we would lose our connection to who the true God is and this is so important because the false gods that are out there are always muddying the water always giving us problems trying to, to focus on who the true God is remembering that the son is subject to the father is critical Ephesians 4, 4 through 6 says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. What is the number we have to remember? Not hard. Romans 2, 3 through 11. Turn over to that. But we know, verse 3, excuse me, and do you think this, O man, you who judge those who practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each one according to his deeds. Eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, ind indignation, and wrath. Tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first, and also of the Greek, but glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For there is no partiality with God. No respect of persons with God. As human beings, we get fair judgment. How critical is that for us as we're navigating our lives, trying to please God instead of men? This reminds me of Galatians 1.10, For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Our successful salvation from God comes back to choosing him this day, believing and being obedient. My final text here, Romans 11.22. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell, severity, but towards you, goodness. If, and there's that, that word that really connects the dot, that's the conditional statement, right? If you continue in his goodness, there's the effort. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. <clears throat> Hopefully the evidence that's been presented today, knowing the true God, understanding to be partaker of his plans, to be part of the church, we have to believe in him through his son. Otherwise, the result could be bad, but we can see the goodness of what he has promised. We just have to hang on, persevere. 
and keep on keeping on. Thank you. Let's have a song. Number 65. Faith like that of Abraham. Number 65. this time to take a moment to look into your words of truth to study your your plans the history that you've presented us in the scriptures so that we can piece together how you intend to bring about your righteousness on this earth we ask that we would consider these things to make proper choices and to choose you this day may we consider our brothers and sisters in faith those that are traveling at this time those who are studying in other places and for those that are seeking may we be ready to give an answer so that they have a chance to partake in this plan that you presented. Give us strength to continue throughout these days to come. We know that they are difficult at times, but we must continue to be obedient to your word so that we can be partakers in that kingdom. And that someday when your son returns, we can hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.